Job chapter 1, verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And and in the remaining verses, Satan fights against him. And if you'll look in verse number 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Chapter number 2 begins the exact same way as chapter 1. And God gives the devil a second chance to fight against Job. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you'll help us. Lord, I pray you'll take my mind and cleanse it, cleanse it of myself. And Lord, I pray that the Word of God can have absolute authority in our, in our minds. Lord, I pray that you'll use it and speak to our hearts. Lord, I do honestly believe that there are some struggling folks, there are some sad people, there are some fearful people, there are some people that are struggling people that the devil is doing everything he can to stop them and fighting against them. And Lord, sometimes it is just extremely difficult to make another day happen. And uh, and God, I I understand that there are some folks in the room that are struggling. And God, I pray this morning that you'll take this passage of Scripture that you have written for us about Job and about the devil and about yourself. And God, I pray you'll help us this morning. Touch us where we are the weakest. Give us strength where we are the weakest. Give us healing where we are the most hurt. Lord, give us wisdom where we are the most confused. Lord, I pray you'll touch us this morning. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. When the devil gets a second chance, chapter 2 begins the exact same way. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin... Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. And Job has had some compound trouble. And in chapter 1, Satan comes against Job, but thank God, uh, Job is the same Job in chapter 2 as he was in chapter 1. And his faith wasn't shaken, but I want us to notice first in chapter 1, I want us you to see Job's favor. Job's favor. When Satan comes before God, Satan doesn't bring Job's name to God. God brings up Job's name to the devil. Now, I would really appreciate it if God never does that to me and never says, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Levi? I would really appreciate it the Lord just never do that. I don't want him sick and... Uh, the dragon on me, I, I, I'm good. I'd rather just not experience that. Is anybody else bearing witness with me this morning? And, uh, but God brings Job up almost in like a bragging way, like, hey, you've been walking up and down in the earth, you've been looking at everybody. 
what do you think about my servant Job? What do you, what do you think about him? And, and it is very obvious from chapter 1 that Job had the favor of God. And I want you to notice that Job's favor was rare. Job's favor was rare. If you look in verse number 8, he said, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth? I mean, there ain't another guy like Job. None like him in the earth. Now, that's not his wife's opinion. Now, my wife believes I'm the greatest man in the earth. She, she believes that. And she, a lot of times she's right. But it ain't Job's wife saying there's none like him in the earth. It's the creator of the earth saying there's none like him in the earth. God has complete authority to make that statement. And God says, look, Job is such a great man and such a good man. There ain't nobody else on the earth like him. God favored him and it was, he was part of a very small, very small group. But it was not just a rare favor. Would you notice it was also a very righteous favor? It's a very righteous favor. He said, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. You see, the favor of God, look this way, the favor of God is not free. God favored Job because Job was a righteous man. The favor of God and the love of God are not the same thing. All right, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All right, while we were yet sinners, God committed his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, the love of God and the favor of God, they are not the same thing. You see, just because you are loved of God does not mean you have the favor of God. You, you've heard, you, you've probably heard this little cliche, but you know, God don't bless wickedness. You know, so Job had the favor of God, but it was because he lived a holy life. Many of us are very guilty of just expecting God to bless us because He loves us, but the favor of God and the love of God, they are not the same thing. Listen, if, if, if they were the same thing, and if everybody that God loved just had God's favor, and if it just made everybody great, then God would have said, Hast thou considered Job and, and, and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy? But He said, It's so rare, there's none like Him in the earth. And Job had a, was very righteous, was a very righteous man. Uh, but his favor was not just rare and righteous. His favor was real. This, this, this is a real man. He said he's a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And I bring that up because I just want to say this, that we have reached a place in, in the world that we think righteous people aren't even real anymore. We've got to a place where we don't think someone can really even be a holy person. And if someone does walk in that's a holy person, we think, well, there's a back door somewhere that's all a facade, that's got to be fake. Where's the sin at? Where's the, where's the wickedness at? And we've gotten to the place that we're not, even, we're not even convinced that somebody can really even be holy anymore. But holiness is a real thing that real people can really do. Holiness is a real thing that real people can really do. And, uh, and so this was a real man. And so I bring that up because so many times we come to the Word of God and we read about men like Moses and Abraham and Job and Elijah and, and Peter, James and John and Paul and all these other guys, and we lose the reality that they were real people just like you and me. They had real wives. They had real mother-in-laws. They had real bills. They had real financial troubles. They had real uh, 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 flus and real... Uh, pains and real attitudes. I mean, they were real people like you and me, but you need to get it through in your heart that you as a real person really can please God. We have gotten to a place in America where we don't even think that's even real anymore. It's like something from a book, something from a movie. But I, and I just want to let you know that a real person really can serve God and please God and, and be real about it. I just, want, I, just wanted to, I just felt good saying that. But that's Job's favor. But I want you to notice also in chapter 1, Job's faith. Job's faith. As God brings Job up, he says he's perfect, he's upright, he feareth God, he escheweth evil, and he's this wonderful man. And Satan's response is a little bit uh, sarcastic. He says, doth Job fear God for naught? Verse number 9. 
Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hand and his substance is increased in the land, but put forth thine hand now, touch all that he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. Um, I'm going to make a statement that probably everybody in here is going to think is blasphemous. But when, when Satan makes these statements in verses 9, 10, and 11, I agree with him. Because Job's faith first was a reserved faith. It was a reserved faith. Satan said, hey, yeah, he serves you and he loves you and he does all these things, but look how much you're protecting him. You've got this hedge around him and you've blessed all that he has. Verse number one says that, uh, verse number three says that he's the greatest man in all the East. He's got more money than anyone in the known world. Or well, yeah, he loves you. Look how good his life is. He doesn't have any trouble. He doesn't have any problems. He doesn't, I mean, look, look how reserved he's been. You have put a hedge around him and protected him. Of course he serves you. He doesn't have any trouble. And it's very easy to look at somebody in their life and see their faith for God. And if you don't also see great trial and great suffering, it's easy to say, well, yeah, they serve God. They don't have a hard time. It's very easy to look at somebody and say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah they love the Lord, but look what all he's given them. They've got the house, the land, the money, the marriage, the family, the, the business, the, the fame, the popularity. Well, of course they love God. Look how good their life is. Now, I want you to notice something in your Bible. Who brought up the hedge? God or the devil? The devil brought up the hedge. You know what that tells me, Brother Charles? It tells me that the devil had already been by Job's house before and knows there's a hedge there. He's already sent some guys, hey, y'all go kick Job in the teeth. We can't kick Job in the teeth. Why not? Because that hedge is over there. We'll see if the gate's open. It's, it's not open. God's got it locked up tight. We'll climb over. It's too tall. We can't get over it. We'll dig under it. It goes too deep. We can't get around it. We can't get to Job. God has a hedge around him. And so Satan's looking at Job thinking, you ain't nothing but a spoiled brat. God's taking care of you. God's blessed you with all these things. And if all these things were gone, then, then, then you'd curse God. And Job had a reserved faith, a faith that had not hurt him yet. But, but then Satan comes against him, and it becomes a retained faith. It becomes a retained faith. In verse number 12, God says, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. There was a day, verse number 13, when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet spaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am alone escaped to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, the, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Satan has taken everything away that Job had. All the blessings are now gone, and he is expecting... Job to curse God and to blaspheme and get angry with God and, and, and turn his back on God. Verse number 20, Satan did not see coming. Job falls upon the ground and begins to worship. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And so Job went through the greatest trial of his life, but his faith was retained. It did not take away his faith in God. He was still worshiping and was still blessing God at the end of absolutely unbelievable sorrow and trial. He had faith that was bigger than the funerals and he was able to still trust God, still worship God, and still bless God in the midst of the most unbelievable trials. Him and his wife experienced the, most, the greatest of all family crises, losing their children. Now how about this? In chapter 1, if you'll look at it with me in verse number 5, 
This is amazing to me. Verse number 5 says, When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them. Who's, who's the them? It's the seven sons and, and the three daughters. In verse number 5, it says, He rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So in chapter 1, before all of this even starts, Job is praying for his children. He is trusting God for his children. And then he loses his children. What he trusted God with, he lost. If you put your money in the bank and said, don't lose my money, and you came back and they said, we lost your money, you would never trust that bank again. Job has trusted God with his children and then lost them. Naturally, you would be thinking, well, he's going to blame God. He trusted God with his children, and then he lost. God let his children die. What kind of God is that? How terrible. Yet, in all this, Job sinned not, neither cursed, neither charged God foolishly. He trusted God with something, and then lost it, yet he still trusted God. That is amazing faith. That is amazing faith. And we have several people in this room right now that have walked down that same path and, and, and have had to go and, and have a funeral for their children. Many, many of you in this room have done that. And I so admire the faith of every mother and every father that can walk through that dark valley and still trust God and still bless the Lord and still stay true to the Lord. I, I admire that faith. And Job has retained his faith. He's retained his faith. It would be so difficult to be in his shoes. And so many of you in this room have been in those shoes. But he's retained his faith. Job's favor, Job's faith. Would you notice lastly this morning, Job's foe? Job's foe. And chapter 2, if chapter 1's not bad enough, there's chapter 2. If chapter 1 wasn't enough, the house, the money, the servants, the business, the farm, the children... If chapter 1 wasn't enough, we have to have a chapter 2. And again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself. And you know the story. God says, where you been? Have you considered my servant Job? And the devil was given a second chance to make Job curse God. And I want you to notice first off about Job's foe was one that he was responsible that he was being held responsible. Now, the Lord asks him in chapter uh, chapter 2 and verse number 2, Whence comest thou? Now, who's asking Satan where he's been? God. Now, does not the Bible say the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good? Does not the Bible say in the book of Psalms, He that formed the eye shall he not see? Don't you think God already knows where Satan's been? Does the Bible not say that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart? So not only does God already know where Satan's been, he also knows what the devil's been thinking about. So why is he even asking this question, where have you been? What you been up to? What have you been doing? I I believe it was because God is is letting us know that he's holding the devil responsible. And for every single person and every single life he destroys, God knows about it, and Satan knows God knows about it, and he's not getting away with anything. I know he's the God of this world, but that God of this world has a God in heaven, and he's responsible to God, and God's keeping a record. God's ke- I wish I had somebody on that. God is keeping the devil responsible, so when he destroys a life, he and God are talking about it. It's not like the devil has free reign to destroy you, he has to give an account for that to God. And one of these days, that'll, mm, mm, one of these days, the adversary is going to be driven to his knees and he's going to be chained up and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity because God is holding our adversary responsible for what he's done to the sons of men. He's holding the devil responsible. And for me, that's a blessing to me. I, I find encouragement in that, that the devil has to go and pay report to God and say, this is where I've been, this is what I've been doing, and, and, and God has, gets a record, and the devil is responsible. And, and, and I just appreciate that. But he's not just, his foe is not just responsible, but his foe is now, in chapter 2, repeated. Repeated. 
And God brings up Job in verse number 3. Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, touch his bone and, he will, and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Satan has already touched everything that Job had. And evidently, what Satan hoped would happen in chapter 1 didn't happen. Satan has not beaten Job. Job has not cursed God. Job has not turned his back on God, nor charged God foolishly. And so now comes round number 2. And Satan is going to get a second chance to destroy his life. And I want, you to, I want you to see something in chapter 2 that is the exact same in chapter 1 that really blesses my heart. When God brings Job up in verse 3, he gives his opinion of Job. He says he's a perfect man. He's upright. There's none like him in the earth, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. This is God's opinion of Job after the great trial. That is God's exact opinion of Job in chapter 1. If you'll see in verse number 8, there's none like him in the earth. He's a perfect and an upright man. Feareth God, sheweth evil. It's one thing for that to be true when you're in the hedge. It's one thing for that to be true when you're in the hedge. And the bank account is as full as it can be. And everyone's healthy and everything's going fine. It's one thing for that to be true when everything is right in the hedge. It's another thing for that to be true when all of that is gone. That's right. That's right. The man in Job 1 and the man in Job 2 are the same man. and His faith has not been changed. His position with God has not been changed. His integrity has not been changed. And though the devil has taken everything out of his life, God's opinion of Job is the exact same. And it is extremely difficult for a person to go through the trials that Job went through and then not change everything about who they are. They become our identity. Grief becomes a part of our personality. Widowhood becomes a part of our personality. The, the funeral with the child becomes a part of our personality. Loneliness and depression become a part of our personality. And sometimes even bitterness becomes a part of our personality. Now, I'm not throwing any stones. I have, I, I have no stones to throw. We'll talk about Job's wife in just a second. And I have absolutely no criticism for Job's wife, none whatsoever. We'll talk about her in just a minute if we get time. But God's opinion of Job is the same because the trial didn't change him. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you are in Job 1 or even Job 2, if you are going through some absolute turmoil that's tearing your life apart, it does not have to change who you are with God. It doesn't have to change who you are with God. And there's one difference in God's opinion in chapter 2 and verse number Three, there's one difference in his opinion. God doesn't take anything away from Job, but God does add something to Job. In chapter 1 and verse number 8, his opinion of Job is there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Four things. Then after the trial, he gives his opinion again in chapter 2 and verse number 3. Are you looking at it? Say amen. amen. There is none like him in the earth. He's a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. There's the four things. But then God adds something. And still holdeth fast his integrity. That is not in chapter 1, but has been added to chapter 2. God has added something to his opinion of who Job is. God has added something to his opinion of who Job is. Integrity. He's added that in. Now, what in, in chapter 1, Job doesn't get anything. He loses. He loses everything. He experiences loss on every level of life. Financial, emotional, physical, uh, in his marriage, in his family. In his, he experiences loss on every level of life. But he also experienced gain. He just didn't know it. 
Brother Austin, he experienced loss in this world. He experienced gain in the other world. He experienced loss here, but he experienced gain with God there. Let that sink in. He experienced loss down here, but experienced gain up there. While everyone's looking at Job saying he's lost his house, he's lost his kids, he's lost his money, he's lost his business, God is saying yes, but he's gained his integrity with me. Here's the thing. Job experienced loss here, but gain there, but he didn't know it. He didn't know it, Brother Stephen. He had no clue he had gained something with God. Only God and the devil knew that. He experienced loss here, but gain there, but he had no way of knowing it. And I wonder how many people sitting in the room this morning, you've gone through awful trial and awful loss down here, but you have experienced gain in heaven, you just don't know about it. You've experienced loss down here in this world. Maybe on every level you can come up with. Maybe you've experienced loss in your business, loss in your family, loss in your finances, loss in your relationships, loss in your mind. You've experienced loss everywhere there can be found loss down here. But with God, you've gained something. Job had loss, but gain. He just didn't know about it. First Peter chapter number one and verse number six, it says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness. Well, we don't like that, do we? Being in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. He said, the trial of your faith is much more precious than of gold. The the trial of the faith or the reward of the faith? Which one's more precious than gold? The trial. In Geneva, Switzerland, there is the CERN Large Hadron Collider. It's this giant tunnel. And things go really, really, really fast and run into stuff. Particles, they... Science, weird stuff. But they discovered that they can take some carbon particles and shoot them in this tube, this tunnel, at this crazy, unbelievable, unnatural speed, running into one another, and the, the shards, the, 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 the ricochets off of that will become gold. They, they can manufacture gold. Man has figured out a way. If you can get to that, that, that tunnel, that, that collider, and charge that thing up and, and have those particles go so fast, when it hits each other, the dust that comes off of it is gold. The problem is that that process is worth more than the product. The, the tunnel, the energy, the staff, just making that happen costs more than the gold is worth. And, and Villarica, which means city of gold, is, is that right? City, that's what that means, right? Villarica means city of gold, where we are from. They, they had these, they there's, you know, gold mines, but they quit digging it out because it, they weren't getting enough for it to be profitable. They were losing money. They, the process was worth more financially than the product. And when we read First Peter chapter one and verse number six and seven, it's 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 not the product that's worth more than gold. It's it's the process. The process is worth more than gold. And isn't it a coincidence that Job is the one that said, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold? We just heard a message on that last Sunday night. And the process is worth more than gold. And, and Job is going through this trial, and, and Job has experienced loss down here, but he's experienced great gain up there in heaven with God. He just didn't even know about it. And, and I believe there are people in the room this morning that you have experienced extreme loss in life, extreme heartache, extreme depression. You have faced some unbelievable dark battles, and all you can see is the loss that you've experienced. But if you could see... Mm, if you could see what God sees, you could see you've experienced gain with Him. He's experienced great gain and loss at the same time. And in this second round with the devil, the devil doesn't play the same. His foe is not just repeated, his foe is revised. And he changes his method. And he doesn't fight Job the same way. He doesn't attack him the same way. He says skin for skin. 
And yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. And this second time Satan comes against Job is not like the first one. I think I'm going to stop there, Miss Leslie, if you can come to the piano. Brother, just skip on to the title slide. That'll be fine. I'm going to stop right here. I wish Satan fought against me the same way every time. If he would just keep running the same play, I can handle it. But he don't. And, and Lord willing, we'll finish this next Sunday morning, but I honestly believe there are some folks, you, just, you really just need a point number two. You really needed that thought of experiencing loss and gain. And I wish somebody had just been able to go and tell Job. But nobody ever did. And nobody ever was able to tell him. And I just want to tell you this morning, if you've been through unreal loss and trial, and you've experienced loss, if you have stayed true to God, you have also experienced gain. You just can't see it. It's not gain down here, it's gain up there. I believe it was the Apostle Paul that said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of Christ. And Job has experienced some great loss. And many of you have experienced the same loss. You've lost business. You've lost family. You've lost children. You've lost friends. Y'all know the story of Job's three friends, don't you? They showed up and said, well, this is all because you're wicked. That's some great friends. And then at the end of the book, all these people show up and start giving him money. I'm like, where y'all been? I mean, where, where y'all been? Friends of Job, my hind leg, where you been? This is, the, Job doesn't happen in just a day. This is, this is months, Job said. He talks about months. So this is probably at least, at least about a year. Where y'all been with the money and the gold and the silver and the clothes? Where have you been? Because Job didn't just lose his stuff, he lost his friends. Some of you have lost your friends. You've lost some relationships. And you can't make sense of it. Because Job never had a chapter 1. Job didn't know God and the devil were doing all this. And he had no idea he had experienced gain. And God had added to his opinion of what Job was. And at the end of the day, isn't that what really matters? What God thinks of us? Let's stand to our feet.